So, Bunny. Yes. It is time once again for us to open up our history books with another learned packed installment. I didn't think of that ahead of time. I probably should have worded that better. With another installment of Steve's Historical Approximations. All right. This is a vaguely reoccurring segment of the Pope on Film podcast, wherein I get a portion of history and retell it in my own voice. So it's not necessarily 100% true, but it's like 92 to 97% true. And it's this true time, enough. Yeah, it's true it's enough. It's truish. Yeah. And this time around, we will be talking about one of our nation's, nay, one of the planet's most important film directors that no one has ever fucking heard of. Okay. This person is amazing and incredible and phenomenal. I learned about her by reading a uh, a travel book. I was just uh, shelving travel books, and I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna look through this." And there was her name right there in the in the middle of this travel book. And I'm like, "Really? I need to learn about this person." And I've just been telling people at work about her. It, it, it's it's incredible. This week, we will be learning about Florence L. Weber. Okay. Better known Never as... Never heard of her. Better known by her stage name, Lois Weber, one of the most amazing and influential uh, uh, women in the history of Hollywood. And it's a shame, an absolute shame that no one knows this person. Maxwell's being real loud and I want to tell him to stop, but he's actually getting Eleanor to laugh, and that's wonderful because she's been super sick. Yeah. So uh you know what? Yeah, so so I'll just I'll allow it. So it's the early nineteen hundreds, and a young woman from Pittsburgh is a street preacher. Okay. Apparently that's good. That was a thing. Think think uh, the it's beginning of thing. God. Yeah. Think the beginning of Guys and Dolls, though. They're yeah. on the street. They're singing. They're passing out literature. Let's do another song. Let's do some dancing. Let's <laughs> let's start preaching. So she's on the street corner. She's singing hymns. She's preaching. She and her peeps in the American <laughs> Church Army Workers Association are traveling to big cities, singing and preaching. They would get church organs and uh, push them and church into... organists. Did yeah, they have church, church organists as yeah, well? Yeah, they would have church organists for their oh, church man. organ. They would have church organists, yeah. and they would get these big ass church organs and push them into the red light districts. And so they would be on the street corner playing in front of like brothels and shit in yeah. New York in like 1902 and stuff. So then the the Church Army Workers Association disbands, but this young woman. Florence L. Weber, she's all, hey, I'm actually pretty good at singing and crap. Maybe I could be a performer of some kind. So apparently she was a prodigy when she was younger. So she 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 go, becomes a music student. She's learning how to uh, play instruments. And so she, in in her early 20s, she's so good at music that soon... She's traveling across America performing. She's singing. She's playing piano. And she's really making a name for herself. She's becoming famous. If she kept going, uh -huh. then by her 30s, she could have been like one of America's most famous pianists, traveling performers. Uh, that is until Charleston, South Carolina. Uh -oh. she's, doing, she's doing this big show. One of her biggest performances ever. She's playing the piano, and in the middle of the song, one of the piano keys just fucking flies off the piano. <laughs> one key just breaks the fuck up mid mid song, mid show, and she was so distraught. She was so uh, just fucked up by this weird, crazy, random happenstance that she never played piano again. Oh my God! It, it, was it demons? I don't know. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. But 
she's like, okay, so no to music. What about acting, though? So uh, Florence L. Weber moves to New York to become an actress. She Apparently, there's already a Florence Weber, so she goes by her middle name. So she's Lois Weber now. She's in a bunch of theatrical performances, a bunch of plays. Eventually, she meets a fellow actor, Philip Smalley. They really hit it off, and they get married. But after they get married, they continue to perform. And their whole thing was, oh, we perform together. And for whatever reason, it's like 1906, 1908. And apparently people were really digging that. And I'm like, hey, you guys are a couple. And <laughs> it's 1908. Everybody talks like this right now. Hey, what's up with that? You know, you know, that that quick speaking sort of yeah. like early 1900s. So so they would they would perform together under the name The Smallies. The Smallies. Hmm. Oh, this this play, The Importance of Death's Question, featuring The Smallies. That's odd. Can you imagine doing that now? Like Mr. and Mrs. Smith starring The Pits. <laughs> That's just weird. You wouldn't imagine a husband and wife performing together in a movie or in a play now under the husband's last name. Yeah. That just that wouldn't happen now. That's just weird, right? Very weird. You, you, we haven't, I, I can't remember the last time we've seen that. Maybe a Stephen Edie Gourmet. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like if they were just the Gourmets. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so so here's well, where I'm they, sure that's what they wrote down on like party invitations and things like that. Yeah. You yeah. know, Christmas cards and things like that. You know, you write out your list. You're going to write the gourmets, you know? Yeah. 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 So here's where things here's where things get big for fucking Laura, Lois, Lois Weber. Hollywood is slowly but surely becoming an actual thing. Yeah. So there's a uh, one or two big movie studios, and then there's like ten really small movie studios. So five of these medium sized film studios say, "Hey, what if we join together? Because you're like a medium small size studio. You're a medium small size studio. You're a medium small size studio. What if we join together, and we can be? If we join together, then suddenly." Uh, uh, we five small uh, film studios will become like this big will become like one of the biggest film studios in the universe yeah. so they named themselves the Universal Film Manufacturing Company and eventually they shorten it to just Universal Studios but that's the birth of Universal Studios this is it, I originally learned this story as a small two paragraph blurb in a guidebook to Universal Studios Orlando. Really? Okay. Yeah. It, it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a travel guide with a lot of pictures about a uh, 2018 guide to Universal Studios Orlando. But in the beginning of the book is like a 25-page essay on the history of the Universal Studios. And so I, I like flipping through that and saying, hey, if I if my family ever goes to Universal Studios in or in Orlando or in Hollywood for that matter, mm -hmm. I will tell all of my kids, you are not allowed to go until you read this essay and write a report. <laughs> Cause I am not gonna take you kids to Universal Studios and then suddenly you see uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon and you're like, Who's that? No. Yeah. No. If we're walking through Universal Studios and you see a, a street sign that says Todd Browning Street, God damn it, you're going to know what that means. Yes. I'm not, uh, I, I ain't playing here. You <laughs> SOBs. So, so, yeah, it was like a tiny two paragraph blurb in that book. So it, it, the Universal Film Manufacturing Company is desperately looking for some talented people to make some things for their brand new studio. They tap the smallies together to start cranking out shorts, one to two real films. And the smallies 
have a, a, all of their films are real high class, high concept, sophisticated stuff. Yeah. Costumes and stuff. But eventually. Smug fucking bastards. Yeah. Yeah. But eventually, and this is a shock because remember, women can't even freaking vote yet. Yes. The people at Universal Studios, Carl Lamel, chief among them, they they bring Philip Smalley and Lois Weber. They bring the Smalleys into the studio and they say, "Hey, uh, you guys have done a number of shorts for us, but we need what we need now is d- our directors." And uh, we've seen the both of you work. We've seen the two of you work. We we love the team of the Smalleys, but uh, it's obvious who the person here is with all the talent. Congratulations, yeah. Lois Weber. You're our newest director. <laughs> Women can't vote, and yet suddenly, Lois Weber becomes their chief director at Universal Studios. Good, for, Very good for her. And it's like 1912, 1913, and, and Lois Weber is like, what should my, what do you want my next film to be about? And then, again, like women don't even have the right to vote yet, but Universal Universal Studios is like, you know what? You write it, you direct it, you make the film you want to make, Lois. What do <laughs> what do Lois Weber's films? What should your films be about? So she starts making her own <laughs> about whatever she wants. In 1914, she does a high class four reel silent film version of William Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. It's the first feature film to ever be directed by a woman. Nice. Meanwhile, over a hundred years in the future, over a hundred years past Lois Weber's Merchant of Venice, they just nomin- they just n- announced the Golden Globes. Not a single female was nominated for directing anything. No movies, no TV shows, no nothing. Yeah. And yet a hundred years, it, it, it almost feels as if women had more of a creative right in 1914 in Hollywood than they do now. And that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would totally have to agree. I mean, you know, how many how many women go through the grinder? I can't think of any good examples here. Yeah, so Lois Weber ended up directing what IMDb estimates is about 135 films. 135? Wow. It's tough to find detailed records, though, because it's like 1915 we're talking about here. It's not like people were taking 100% detailed records. There wasn't an IMDb in 1915. Yeah. So she was a pioneer. And and you got to remember... Hollywood was just starting out so she decided for one of her first films she was going to make a suspense film you know what she (laughs) called the film what suspense well it wasn't taken yet that's awful yeah 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 yeah. there there weren't many suspense films that had been made up to that point so she's like I'm going to make a suspense film I'm going to call it suspense (laughs) so 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 she 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 said okay so She's on the phone here. She's on the phone to someone. And uh, it's a very important call. But then someone starts spying on the call. So this is what I want to happen in this in this scene in the film. On one side of the screen, you see this woman talking on the phone. Mm-hmm. And on the other side of the screen, you see the person she's talking to. And then the studio's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean... We split a screen? That's never been happened before. That's never (laughs) happened before. It's 1913. We can't do a split screen. (laughs) Who's? uh, No one's heard of that. We can't do split screens. And she's like, I'm Lois Weber, damn it. (laughs) I have a vagina. So they're like, okay, let's see if we can do it. So yeah, she did the first ever split screen. Nice. Movie. She, Ryan she, De Palma owes her a, a very big debt. Yeah, yeah. She's a r- ridiculous pioneer. A ridiculous pioneer. In 1913, she started experimenting with sound. Yeah. 
1913, for shit's sake, she was trying to get sound in her movies. In 1918, she directed the first ever Tarzan movie. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The first ever Tarzan that was ever on uh, on the silver screen was her. She just said, hey, there's this book. It's it's called Tarzan the Ape Man. I want to do it. Whoa, you want to get a book and turn it into a movie? Calm down there, lady. <laughs> it's 1818. We can't just get books and turn them into movies. Well, I guess we'll trust you. After all, you are the Lois Weber. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 has some collateral. Yeah. In her 135-ish film, she also may have been one of the first people to use Hollywood to combat social ills. She's reading off her shit. She did? Uh, let me smell you. You smell good? Yeah. You smell sentient. She, she, she used her films to combat social ills and champion societal issues. She was like D.W. Griffith, but without all the KKK crap. <laughs> yeah. She just She was one of the first directors and definitely the first female director to ever say, I want my films to teach people and to prove a point. But but other people were like, yes, I want to do that, too. My film's going to be about how drugs are bad and people shouldn't have sex. But she went in a completely different route, in a completely different route. In 1916, in 1916, she made a film that was uh, that was about abortion. Really? In 1916, it was a film that tried to teach people, hey, uh, uh, you know, practicing uh, safe sex, this is good. <laughs> so in 1916, she made a movie. It was called Where Are My Children? 1916. Okay, it's important. <laughs> Where to are my children? My God, that that title is a little on the chilling side. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 when you get to it. Again, 1916, okay? Yeah. 1916! So, <laughs> so here's the plot. The film concerns District Attorney Richard Walton, who is prosecuting an abortion doctor. Uh-huh. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and he's like, oh, you perform abortions. You perform illegal abortions, and that's horrible. You, you, you know, we, we need to send you in jail. And and I need to see your records so I can see all the people who you've given abortions to because we need to shame these people for being horrible. Yes. And the doctor's like, no, you can't do that. Uh, you'll have to put me in jail to do that. And so this district attorney is getting all this praise for fighting this abortion doctor. Meanwhile, his uh, wife is going, hey, you know, maybe you should just leave the guy alone. You know, maybe maybe the people who've got these abortions, maybe, you know. The, they're they're not one hundred percent happy and excited with getting these abortions, but like you don't want to shame these people. And he's like, "No, you don't understand. I need to put this person in jail." And so, it, during the course of the trial, eventually the district attorney uh, throws the throws the abortion doctor in jail, gets a hold of the records, and finds out that his own wife as well as most of her friends got an abortion from this guy. Yeah. Dun, dun, and, the, dun. and the title of the film is what the DA yells at his wife after learning about it. What does he yell? The title, oh, where are my where, children? Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, uh, that seems pretty heavy handed, man. A film about abortion. When was this movie made again? 1978, 1969. Oh, yeah. 1916. <laughs> it's safe to say that the censors didn't like her. I I would think not. Her, hey, she made another film in 1916. But those, but those were the good days before before there was any kind of haze code or anything like that. You you find That's a lot like of fucking strange shit with um with silent movies well like look at Haxon and how just gross it was so, 
Yeah, her 1916 film entitled Shoes was all about prostitution. <laughs> all right. And uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of the Hayes Code was about a lot of things, but when they made the <laughs> in the back of their minds was freaking uh, 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 Lois, <laughs> Lois Weber. Yeah, because I'm of sure. the things she did. Now that brings us to her best known work. Yeah. The 1915 film. The hypocrites. The hypocrite. Hmm. It's all about my Christ- It's all about Christianity. Nice. <laughs> it's it's very anti Christianity, but that's not the thing that pissed people off. No. Okay. The film starts with a medieval monk. Again, this is 1950. The film starts with a medieval monk, and he's been working for years and years and years in isolation, going mad, working on this giant, massive statue that he's been carving out of rock. And he says that that he's he has seen truth. He has seen the face of truth. He knows what truth is. He knows what truth looks like. And so he just, this medieval monk just locks himself away and he's working on this statue that, that, that will be, that will be the ultimate representation of truth. And he's working on it and working on it and working on it. And finally the, the whole village comes together because he's done with the statue and he's going to unveil it. So the whole village is there and he, he finishes it and the statue is a graphic statue of a naked woman. <laughs> and so it, it's like, hey, it's the medieval times. You can't make a you can't make this statue a naked woman. The 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 crowd gets angry and kills the monk. Ooh, that's that's yeah, pretty stiff okay. there. Cut to the modern day and there's a pasture. There there's a pastor, not a pasture. <laughs> pastor of like a big huge cathedral type mega church and it's a bunch of christians and they they only care about being seen as christians instead of actually acting like christians they don't they're all horrible people yeah but they just want to be seen driving their you know looking their best and going to church and praying so then the con- the congregation one Sunday is visited by the naked truth who exposes all of the congregation's faults and flaws and sins in like a like a montage way the naked truth uh walks through the church and you see each person's flaw oh this person's cheating on his wife this person is uh this person is uh stealing from his company this person is a liar. This person hates poor people. This person's a racist. This person's gay, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, but the naked truth that visits the church is exactly like the monk statue, played by a naked woman, literally, head to toe, full frontal nudity. The first ever Hollywood nude scene ever. <laughs> nice. In 1915. It's actually like a scathing attack at Christianity, but if you find out anything about it, it's, uh, what would happen if a naked woman were to walk through a church? That's the plot of the film The Hypocrites. That's exactly how the travel book described this film. Oh, that sounds that's awful. Not, but that's, not what, the, that's yeah. not what the film is about. That's just what it's known for. For the first time ever in Hollywood, in 19 freaking 15, they showed the first ever fully nude scene. Nice. In fact, historians say that the, the fact that the director was a woman helped the film get released. There's no way the film would have been released if it was a man. Yeah. Who had made the film. And let me tell you, in New York City, there were literal riots at this film. Yeah? Cool. People weren't ready to go to a movie and see any sort of nudity, let alone full frontal nudity. Yeah. The, the first time ever, there were riots in New York when it was released. A number of states banned it. In Boston, the mayor demanded that they get the film. And they they fi- they painted clothes over each 
frame of the woman nude, <laughs> Gumby style. You know how Gumby used to do those crappy special effects? Yeah. Yeah. They Gumbied clothes on her. Oh. 1915, Bunny. <laughs> this woman is a Hollywood hero, Nate. Yeah. She has a she has a wall. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But nowadays, nowadays, hardly anyone remembers this woman or her work, which is a damn shame. She was literally for a number of years. She was the highest paid director in Hollywood, period. Yeah. And that's ridiculous because nowadays, what what is Hollywood doing? Oh man, we we need to make uh, we need to make this Wonder Woman movie. Should we get a female to direct it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we were hire females. Okay, well we'll hire a female to 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 write and direct this film, Wonder Woman. Uh, but oh, what are you doing? Don't give her a three. Don't give her a three-picture deal like we give the men. Mm-hmm. Here's 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 a here's a deal to direct one <laughs> film. You you don't get our standard three-picture deal, female director. We'll sign you up for one Wonder Woman movie, and then we're cutting you off because you have a vagina. <laughs> oh, oh wait, Wonder Woman has become uh, the biggest uh, superhero movie for this studio. Great. Well, we'll sign her up for one more movie. And that is it. I'm sorry. Just because you had one of the biggest hits of the year doesn't mean we're going to give you a multi-picture deal person with a vagina. Mm -hmm. And that's bullshit. Yeah. But in like 1918, she was the highest paid director, period. She was getting about $500,000 a week in like 1916. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's rolling in the shit. Yeah. Those are huge freaking numbers. It's amazing. Everyone should know this badass woman, especially now that it's 100 years later and women directors are still fighting for equality. In 1917, with a bit of backing from Universal Studios, Lois Weber literally started her own goddamn film studio. Yeah. Lois Weber Productions. Yeah. Yeah. A- 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 any crossover to Mary Pickford? Because she was a real incredibly uh, strong woman in the silent yeah. film era. Not that I know of. I've got a picture of her I meant to send to you. But, uh, but, but yeah, they, they interviewed like Carl Lamel back in the day and they're like, what, why are you, why are you giving uh, money to Lois Weber so that she can uh, uh, run a competing film studio and he said basically I would trust Lois Weber with any amount of money to do whatever she wanted because she is a genius nice yeah I love this woman I love this woman Lois Weber she is one of the most important people in the history of Hollywood and no one has any idea who she is yeah she I, actually- I, had, I had no idea yeah for her abortion film, Where Are My Children, any time there was a a woman that was pregnant in the film, what she did is she superimposed like a small picture of a baby or a fetus over the woman that was pregnant during the movie. Yeah. So like so like in the film, Where Are My Children, if like a a, a wife gets pregnant. But then, oh, I better not tell my husband because I don't know if I'm going to keep it. Throughout the movie, you see this ghost child over the woman's shoulder. Oh. And it stays there until she gets the abortion. Really creepy. That's, yeah, that's pretty fucking brutal. Yeah. And when was that movie made again? 1916! (laughs) She was like in a different, she was on a whole nother level. Uh, Charlie Chaplin's like, I'm going to make a film about a poor man who eats a shoe. (laughs) Meanwhile, across town, this woman is like, okay, my next film is going to be about a uh, uh, drug addicted prostitute who kills a man in (laughs) self-defense. Yeah. 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 
So Lois Weber, she is freaking amazing. Look her up. <laughs> it, it, Hollywood has to make that movie now. I, I, I think. Yeah. Now is the time to do this. Now is the time. And especially since more women in history are like coming to light. Yeah. You know, the ones that usually catch my attention are, 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 are all the women from NASA that we had never heard of. Yeah. And that is Steve's historical approximation around. Uh, next time you see a female director or nudity or a split screen or a woman who's being haunted by a ghost fetus, be sure and thank pioneering female film director Lois Weber. Yeah, nice. Lois Weber. Nice. I, I think you've done the world a service today. I think so, too. This is an amazing story. I love yeah. this woman. She kicks ass. Totally. 